book of Luke, chapter 14. I'd like to read verses 15 through 24. 15 through 24. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at the supper, at supper time rather, to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are ready now. And they all, with one, one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have, or I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his, sir, his Lord these things, and the master, then the master, of the house began, i um, having trouble reading tonight, sorry. Master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring them hither and the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. And yet... There is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for allowing us to be here. We, thank, we, we, we hope that everyone here is looking forward to the supper. We, we hope that they're all hungry for the supper tonight lord we it, it should be our greatest desire to see that to come to fruition we just ask that we should uh, examine ourselves make sure that we are in our hearts prepared make sure that we have done all that we can to see our friends our loved ones our neighbors our, our uh, even strangers there at the supper with us we just ask that your hand be upon us tonight as we endeavor to preach this sermon from your great word. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name that you might receive the honor, praise, and glory. Amen. Amen. Ask tonight, are you hungry for the supper? Are you hungry for the supper? Now, perhaps there's a better text to preach on this subject, but Jesus tells the story, obviously, of this great supper, and the, the issue was that there were many who had uh, thought well, that, that they were going to be at the supper. The, the people of Israel the, and, and the Pharisees and, and many of those, many of us today think that we're going to be okay because we are church people. We were raised in the church. Uh, we perhaps made a profession, but we make excuses. But we as the people of God, we who, who know that we know that we know that Jesus is our Savior, we should be looking for that supper. I, I, I kind of feel that as we look forward to that time, you know, we think about the calamity upon the earth, and surely we're not rejoicing in the fact that, that men are going to die, men are going to go to hell, people are going to uh, uh, suffer during that great tribulation period that, that the world seems so dark. Yet we have to remember there is a great supper that we are going to. People get excited for the holidays. People get excited. Oh, Christmas is coming up. Uh, you know, uh, Thanksgiving is coming up. Whatever holiday that they enjoy. Uh, Easter, whatever it is they enjoy. And they get excited Birthdays, we get excited about birthdays, birthday celebrations. Some of you are looking at me nasty. Um, I guess I should be, but uh, even older people should rejoice in their birthday. God has given them another year. 
I noticed a few years ago that, um, you know, when you're four, five, six years old, even three, you know, you, you, you look forward to your birthday and um, you want to tell everybody how old you are. You know, you're three years old and you say, I, I, I'm this many. Or you, somebody will say, I, I'm four. They used to joke about the girl next door to me who was about a year older than me. Uh, she would turn five years old and the next day she'd say, well, I'm about to be six. She was looking forward to that birthday. She was looking forward to growing up and being older and being bigger. Uh, um, one of the issues that I had when I turned 22, I thought, well, there's no more birthdays to look forward to. You know, you look forward to uh, all those birthdays when you're a kid, and then you look forward to being a teenager, and then you look forward to uh, being 16 and getting your driver's license, and being 18 and being an adult, and being 21 and being considered, an, uh, you know, uh, 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 being affirmed that you're an adult. And I turned 22, and I thought, all the other birthdays are going to be okay. You're over the hill now. You know, I'd seen people, you know, uh, when you go into work and they're, they're in their department, they'd have the black balloons out, say over the hill because they're 40, 50, 60 years old. But I've noticed as people get older that they like to tell everybody their birthdays once again. Being around my mother, being my father-in-law, I'm 80 years old. And they brag about it. I'm 90 years old. And they brag about it everywhere. I'm 92, I'm 90, you know, whatever it is, they like once again. Oh, if we had that excitement thinking about the supper that we're about to go to, the supper that is prepared. Yes, there's going to be a hard time on this earth, but God, by his grace, God, by his mercy, has called us up. He has chosen us. He has bidden us, and he has drawn us to that great supper, and we should be excited about that supper. You know, right now they're in the football playoffs. Uh, in in a, a little bit of... Uh, uh, a few weeks, there's going to be the Super Bowl. People are excited about that. They're wanting their team to get in. Players are wanting to get in. People are planning, even team, people that don't have a team in there, they're planning parties for these championship games. Um, here in Kentucky, they uh, are looking forward to March Madness. I don't know if this year they're looking forward to as, as much as they have been, but they look forward to March Madness. They're hoping to be in that Final Four. They're hoping to win a championship. Should we not be more excited about the Great Supper? Amen. Should we not be excited that, that, that we are going to be in? That we are not going to be excluded from that Supper? Now, Jesus here was talking to the people of Israel. And uh, as I said, many of Israel thought, because I'm an Israelite, I'm going to get in. Because I'm a, a, a child of Abraham, I'm a descendant of Abraham, that I'm going to get in. And Jesus revealed, John the Baptist revealed, that it was, wasn't just, you weren't born. What was it that Jesus said, or, or, or the book of John says, um, about how it's not a flesh and it's not a blood. Let me see if I can find that real quick. That just popped into my head. Usually things pop out of my head, but this popped into my head. Um, verse 12, John chapter 1. To as many received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were not born or which were born not of blood. In other words, you're not going to get in just because you're a Jew. You're not going to get in because your parents are saved. You're not going to uh, get in because of any affiliation you have if, if any, with anyone in the world. Or not by blood, not by the will of the flesh. You cannot desire it. As a matter of fact, you do not desire it in your flesh. Not of the will of man. It is not your will but of God. Many that think that they're going to stroll into that supper are not going to make it. But he says, you know, the, the, the supper is go, go tell the servant, to, go tell all those that were bitten. As I said back in the day, it would have been go tell the children of Israel those that, that were bidden, those that have had the scriptures, those that have had the gospel preached to them. But the time is ready. 
We in America have such a great uh, advantage as far as hearing the gospel. Now it's going to turn into a disadvantage because this country has rejected the gospel. But in this, this book that I'm currently reading talks about uh, pr the, our, our prayer life. And he said, you know, it's, uh, it's not influenced by Things like, you know, so in our country, people have Bibles. Some of us have many Bibles. In other countries, they may not have a Bible in their hand. I've heard of some countries where, where even the Bible is illegal, where they might have a, paper, a piece of scripture, a page or two, and how they value that. It says your, your, your prayer doesn't matter how much of the written down word of God you have. There's no advantage of being rich or poor. There's no advantage in, in, in anything. You can pray and have a great prayer life if you set your heart upon it, if you set your time upon it. We have all sorts of advantages. We have churches open at this very hour around the country. Now, I know some are in different time zones and some are meeting later and some are meeting earlier. And, and, uh, uh, but even with the number of churches that have closed, even with the number of churches that are not having e Sunday evening services, probably due to lack of attendance, we have churches available. We have Bibles available. We have uh, internet ministries available. If I don't totally mess this sermon up, this will well, probably post it on the internet, the Lord willing, and, and we're not hindered in some other way. You can turn on the radio and hear the gospel. There are bookstores filled with books about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet many will not make it to the supper. Just as these that were bidden, those that, that, that thought they were going to go in. The invitation is extended. Now you'll notice, you'll notice, now we believe, we believe that God has a chosen people. Now many still think, well, that's Israel. Israel was chosen because they were the children of Israel, of Abraham, Abraham, rather. We are children of Abraham by faith. Jesus said, you, you say you're children of Abraham, but, but he believed in me. If you were children of Abraham, you would believe in me. We are Abraham's children. We are included in that family because of faith. As John said, it is not of blood. It is not of the will of the flesh. It's of the will of God. But the invitation is out there. As a matter of fact, the gospel invitation is for everyone. As I was talking to my preacher brothers yesterday, and more listening than talking, we were talking about how people get so hard shelled that they think that they don't need to share the gospel. And they say, well, you know, whoever's going to be saved is going to be saved. And what is the purpose of sharing the gospel? Because when you share the gospel, you run the risk of getting into conflict, don't you? Not everybody wants to hear the gospel. So if they're going to be saved anyway, if they're going to be saved, why, why, why run that risk? Why have that conflict? Why have that argument? Why have that harshness? One of the brothers said, well, number one, it's the command of God that we preach the gospel. It is the commission of Jesus Christ, I will add, that we preach the gospel.
But it is by the preaching of the gospel, Paul said, the foolishness of preaching. The world thinks it's foolish. The foolishness of preaching that people are saved. It is the hearing of the gospel that brings them to faith. The Holy Spirit does not work where the gospel is not preached. There will not be one soul at the supper who has never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we understand it is the Spirit that makes it effectual. But that does not diminish our responsibility to preach the gospel. The invitation is simple. Sometimes we convolute it. Sometimes we make it complicated. People want to add to the gospel. They want to add works to it. They want to add this to it. They want to add that to it. Uh, some will say, well, well, salvation is free. It's of grace. But you have to make the decision. Once again, the salvation is dependent upon you. Well, salvation is free and you can be saved and you can make a decision. By the way, uh, Brother Mike said yesterday, he said, you know, people use that term decision. He said, you know, we had 100 people there and we had 13 decisions. He said, no, you had 100 decisions. Some decided not to come forward and some decided to come forward. But anyway, as we preach and we tell them to come, it, it, it's just that simple. People want to add. You have to perform this work. You have to be baptized. You have to do this. You have to stay saved. Jesus will save you by grace. You're saved by grace through faith and, and trusting Jesus, but you have to continue to hold on. You have to hold out. You have to stay there to the end. Scripture says that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. The reason we stay to the end is because the Spirit keeps us to the end. The book of Jude says that Jesus is able to keep us from falling. The book of Philippians says he is able to keep that which he's committed unto you against that day. In other words, the day of judgment. So let's not add to, let's not complicate the invitation. The invitation is just come. The invitation is just come. It was so simple that as a little boy I heard that invitation and I came. As I told you, I'm reading the book. The man says, you know, I was talking about the different things. He said, it doesn't matter. Just, it doesn't matter how educated you are, how uneducated you are, how intelligent you are, how unintelligent you are. It's the same way with the gospel. Not many wise, not many noble come to know the gospel. It is given to us by God. We say, come. Jesus made it simple. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Isaiah says, come and buy without money. Seek the Lord while he may be found. We are to come to Christ. And we come at the bidding of the invitation. We understand the invitation is also sure. In our text, he says, all things are ready. The issue is not, is this supper going to happen? The issue is, when's it going to happen? It's ready. Jesus has done everything necessary. Everything is provided for any that come to the supper.
The only thing we're waiting on is for the last of those that are chosen to hear that invitation and come. I think people sometimes, and, and they try to rationalize, just as these people making excuses try to rationalize, they, they try to put off the supper. Oh, I just want more people. The Lord knows the exact amount, and His house is made for the exact amount, and when the house is going to be filled, the supper is going to come. All things are ready. This is something that not, not something that might happen. It's something that's going to happen. The invitation is serious. Now you and I have all got invitations to things before, and we say, "Well, you know." And we sometimes we do make excuses, and sometimes they're good excuses. But this is a, a, a serious invitation. You don't want to miss out on this supper, not just because it's a good supper, not just because it's a good time, not just because there's good fellowship. Because there's another supper coming. And that is the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. And the birds are going to feast at that supper. This is a serious invitation. This is not one we could just blow off. We see in verses 18 through 20 that the invitation is extended. Now Jesus came first to the Jews Even Paul in, Rome, in the book of Romans, as he's, he, he, is, he is already performing the ministry as his apostle to the Gentiles. He said the gospel came to the Jews first and the Greeks later. For thousands of years, the Jews had heard that Jesus was coming. And they missed out. The invitation was ignored. Excuses were made. Now we hear excuses all the time. Now we invite people to church, don't we? And we've heard all kinds of excuses. As a matter of fact, when, when, when I got older and started going out and uh, we had a, uh, a um, visitation night, I kind of figured, found out that if people said they weren't going to come, they didn't come. I don't remember anybody telling us when they, we invited them to church and they said, no, I'm not coming, and they showed up. Now they could. What a joy that would be. If they said they might come, chances are very, very good that they wouldn't come. And if they said they would come, they probably didn't come anyway. But it's always worth it when that one person came. There are people that we ask and ask and ask and finally... Or we witness to. I've got friends that I talk to for a long period of time. And then finally they, 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 the Holy Spirit took what they heard from me and what they heard from other people and saved them. But people have all sorts of excuses. One of the brothers was, was talking about and it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the man here says, well, I, I'm just, I've just got a wife now. 
He's using his wife as an excuse why he couldn't go. He said, I've got a guy at my church and he uh, grew up as a, a, in the church and his family were Christians, you know, they were saved and they had a good profession of faith. And, um, but he was the one that, you know, got out in the world and got away from the Lord. And, 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 um, but now he's back in church and he says he's saved and from his testimony, sounds like he's saved. And it's like, well, you need to be baptized. You need to submit to baptism. And uh, he said, well, you know, I don't know about my wife, how she's going to react to that. Says, or she may decide she wants to go to a Catholic church or something like that. And he's using someone else's an excuse. I heard an excuse today on why somebody, uh, they were blaming somebody else on why they didn't say hallelujah. But in any event, the excuses were made. You know, I, I bought this property. I, I bought these oxen. I, I, I've got a wife now. And they go into great explanation many times why they cannot follow the Lord. And you know what those excuses? I'll be honest with you. They sounded good. They sounded good. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we were, um, when I was up in Ohio, uh, and I was one of the deacons there at the church, one of our missionaries who had been in New Zealand for years, and he was older now, and his health was failing. I believe he had cancer, and he... Uh, had to move his ministry to Hawaii because that's where the military base was and he was a veteran and he needed to get medical treatment that he couldn't get in New Zealand. So they moved to uh, 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 Hawaii and he continued on to be a missionary and, he, and everything is expensive in Hawaii. But he found a piece of ground that was fairly found some property I guess that was that was fairly inexpensive for Hawaii and he was contacting all the churches that had supported him and other churches trying to gather enough money to put down on this property that they could have their mission there and boy Hawaii I, but they need they need the gospel in Hawaii they're as wicked in Hawaii as they are in any country in the world. In the darkest countries, in the Muslim countries, in the Buddhist countries where, where the, the gospel is rarely seen, Hawaii is as wicked as they come. So he, he said, you know, I'm I, trying to get money. And I said to the, the pastor and the other deacons, I said, you know, in the Bible, it says you don't buy a piece of property without going to look at it. So I volunteer for you all to send me to Hawaii so I can check out this property before we make a decision on whether we want to give money to it. And of course, the other deacons being weasels, they tried to say, well, no, I, I should be the one to go. But I was the one who had the idea. But anyway, these excuses sound good. People will give you excuses all the time and they sound good to them and you listen to that and you're like, what? What? Are, are, are you serious? But they have convinced themselves that this is a good... Don't let anything keep you from the marriage supper. Because these excuses are exposed. What good are excuses when the door is shut? What good are the excuses when the, when, when, when the call comes out that the bridegroom cometh and you have no oil in your lamp? At the judgment, all these excuses will be exposed.
Now understand this. God knew all along who he was going to save. He knew that Israel would reject him as a nation. He wasn't worried and he said, well, now I need to go find someone else. That's not what this parable was teaching. It's just dem demonstrating that once those initially that heard the gospel rejected it, then it spread throughout the world. As a matter of fact, it was his desire that the gospel go throughout the world. It was never his desire that, that Israel, the Jews, would be the only ones saved. And by the way, he's not forgotten Israel either. They're going to make a great comeback. But we see the direction of this grace. He said, all right. I want my house full. We're having a great supper. I want everyone to be there. He said, go out into the city. Bring the poor, the maimed, the, the, the halt, the blind. Any in the city, go out and bring them in. The gospel went out into the world. That was always his desire. The direction of the gospel was always outward. You know, we've got the gospel here in this building. The direction of the gospel should be outward. I am preaching to the best of my ability to unite the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm looking at a bunch of people that have made a profession of faith. The gospel has to be go outward. Hopefully we'll be able to use the internet to share the gospel outward, but, but that does not take away our responsibility to personally go out and bid them to come. The direction of the gospel, the direction of this grace is outward. The direction, the desire of this grace For us, it would be that all would be saved. That all would hear the gospel. I was telling them about a, uh, hearing a preacher one time. He said, I think some of you guys, you hard shells out there, are afraid you're going to lead someone to Christ who's not one of God's elect. Our desire is that all would hear the gospel. that all would be saved. We know that that's not God's plan, but our desire should be for everyone not to pick and choose. Well, I don't like that person, so I hope they don't get in. That person has done me wrong. No, we preach the gospel, and if they've done you wrong, live the gospel in front of them that they might see the gospel, that they might be one. And the, man, the demand of this gospel is to compel them to come. Go out into the city and get everyone you can. And once you've reached everyone in the city you can, go out into the highway and the hedges that the house would be full. We like to see a full house. Sunday night we had a full house. It was good to see. And it's good to see you all back tonight. Brother Wilder said he is encouraged by me and Brother Sean Duncan. He says, you don't have big churches, but you guys just stay at it. And I, my attitude is always, what else would I do? What else would I do? Everything else is just a waste of time. I would rather be in here with a few of God's people than be doing anything else right now. I've often said that, that, that we will not be judged by how many people make professions. 
we will be judged by our faithfulness. We need to be faithful because God is faithful. We need to be faithful because God judges our faith. You know what Paul said that, that, that the Lord was going to say to him now? He was at the end of his life. And he said, you know, it, it won't be much longer. I've run my race. I've fought a good fight. i finished the course. He didn't say God would say, well done. You've won a lot to Christ. Now he did. But that's not what he said. He didn't say, well, well done because you were chosen to write most of the New Testament. He said, that he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We may not have the abilities of Paul. We may not, might not uh, be able to to reach as many as people as Paul did. We may not have the influence. None of us will have the influence. I can pretty much guarantee you that. None of us will have the influence that Paul had. Or any other preacher that's alive today, any other person that's alive today, they may have a greater influence. But we can be just as faithful. Just as I said, this book said that that it doesn't matter your education, your economic status, your, your intelligence. None of that matters. All that matters is that you're faithful in your prayers. All we can do is be faithful. And God will judge us on our faithfulness. Are you hungry for the supper? Can you smell it? You know, it's been a while since we've had a dinner here, and I know we're, we're uh, hindered now by uh, our situation with the stove and everything. But there are times we've had supper where I'm up here preaching and I can smell cooking in the back. It makes you hungry. The, my audience is hungry. when I, the, the, the people at the church are hungry here, you know, uh, Sometimes Brenda would put uh, turkey or something in the crock pot overnight. And I'd wake up in the morning, I'd smell that turkey. Oh, I wanted that turkey, but I had to wait till after church before it was ready, before I could have it. We should be anticipating, we should be hungry for that supper. Our greatest desire should be at that supper and to see others at that supper. Would you stand?